came to Jericho is Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd. So I just want you to notice the only people in the story are Jesus and followers of Jesus. There's no Roman pagans. There's no uh, awful people. There's no Tiglaths. You know, these, this is Jesus and his disciples and some people following, right? So these are people following Jesus. You might call them the church, right? You might call them Christians, people who are following Jesus. And a blind man named Bartimaeus, that's the son of Timaeus, is sitting on the roadside begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, well, Jesus, son of David. It's a whole other message for another time. Why would you call him son of David? His dad was obviously Joseph, right? But Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him. Well, who's there? Followers of Jesus. So what's happening in this story is followers of Jesus are rebuking the beggar in their own pursuit of Jesus. What you have in this story is you have people who've surrendered to God's moral will for their life, but they still have not connected how Jesus saw particularly people who can do nothing in return for them. Namely, can you imagine the irony of Christians rebuking a beggar in their own pursuit of Jesus, the, the, the irony just jumps off the page with some comedy, like, shut up, blind man. Don't you see we're following Jesus? And Jesus is like, wait a minute, but I'm about him. Like, what are you doing? Right? And, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. Now, one of the things we learn in this story, next slide, is the same kind of lesson from Jonah, which leads me to these questions, because Sermons are not meant to be agreed with or disagreed with. They're meant to be wrestled with for application. Like, if your only thought is, boy, I like this, I agree with it, so? And, and if your thought is, I hate this, I disagree with it, also so? Great sermons aren't meant to be agreed with or disagreed with. They're meant to be wrestled with for application, right? Amen. So, so, and the best way to wrestle with something is to ask questions. Like, are we overlooking the beggar in our own pursuit of Jesus? Have we surrendered to God's moral will for our life while not ever connecting emotionally to how Jesus feels about them? This is why when I think about your community feeding and this, this is that. This is like, this is a group of people who go, believing in Jesus is not enough. It, it's, it's seeing the world how Jesus saw the world and seeing God how Jesus saw God and applying scripture how Jesus applied scripture. So we're not going to be a group of people just waiting to go to heaven when we die. We, we want to be people who bring heaven to every place we see hell Amen. here. So we want to bring that, right? Because are, are we pursuing God's will for us while ignoring his will for the rest of the world? Let's say it this way. Maybe pursuing Jesus and loving our world is the same thing. Like you can't be humble before God and harsh with people. So you can't say, well, I just love Jesus with all my heart. But then when I look at your life, you hurt people intentionally just doesn't work like just one thought for the bible nerds if you're like a bible nerd here is so jesus said uh, the whole of scripture can be summarized in love the lord your god with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself so um one of my degrees in undergraduate school was in greek okay so i can i can actually read greek all right so so this is total bible nerddom the and there is in something called first attributive position. I promise this won't last more than 12 seconds, okay? <laughs> first, so if you're not a nerd, you're, okay? So first attributive position means, in the Greek language, that the first condition and the second condition are the same, right? So Jesus says, here's the whole of scripture in one nutshell. Love God and love people. And by the way, loving God and loving people are the same. That when you love people, you are loving God, and when you love God, you are loving people you cannot separate the two you mm -hmm. cannot there's there's by the way there's a whole book um if you haven't read it it's just awesome there's a whole book about this it's called first john and first john <laughs> first john is john going okay it doesn't matter if you're the rightest doctrinal church in brisbane if you're not motivated by whatever you know about god to be kinder to your neighbor what difference yeah. Does that? That's good. Man. Yeah, hey, right? Like, like this is why we all get a little nauseous, even if we don't say anything, <laughs> with the person that's over the top in worship, over the top in how holy they are. Yeah. But then when you, 
when you look at it, like Jesus said it this way, beware of the Pharisees who wear their tassels too long. It, the, the tassels were the corners of, of the garments. That, it, it, that, In other words, be, beware of people who are too loud about how holy they are. If you look close enough, normally not. Like, be careful. Like, be careful someone. Like, I've never met a prophet in my life who introduced themselves as the prophet. Prophets are normally the people. Other people are like, "Hey, watch out!" Right? It's 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 like like, like somebody says somebody says, "Hey, I'm the prayer warrior here." Normally not. Normally the prayer warrior somewhere praying. They're not doing whatever they're doing in order to be seen. Yeah. Amen. Um, it, it, like, or have we separated loving God from loving people? Let, let's say it a few different ways. Nick, next slide. How does the book of Jonah end? So let's think about this. The book of Jonah ends with a question. The question is quite confronting. Should I not love them just because? Which leads me to all kinds of questions about how I've heard people talk or post or whatever, where they, they frame somebody else as the other, declare them evil, scapegoat them, and then act like God is for us and not for them. And I don't think anybody would intentionally do that, but sometimes, sometimes it comes across that way, that we're us and them sort of thing. Wait a minute, hang on. The book of Jonah ends with, I, I know that they use their infinite power to peel people's faces off, but I still care about them just because they're people. Uh, um, what is the first and only description of Jonah being happy? This is where it gets really confronting. The only description in the whole book of Jonah being happy is him sitting in his own comfort waiting for God to destroy people he doesn't like. <laughs> now that is confronting. Think about the whole book of Jonah. How many opportunities he have to be happy? A lot. And God called Jonah and he was happy to be called by God. No, no. And Jonah did the exact opposite thing and God didn't kill him. He was really happy about that. Yeah, no, uh-uh. And Jonah got on of all random boats he could have got on, he chose boats with merchants that care about people more than prophets. And he was really happy about that. No, no. And even though he got thrown overboard anyway, he didn't drown because there happened to be a fish. Boy, I was so happy about the fish. You never see Jonah go so happy about the fish. Never. Even though the fish saved his life. Oh, and, and God told the fish to throw up. Man, I was so happy that, that he told the fish to throw up because it was horrible. Right? So, and so the fish throws up. I'm so happy about it. No, no. And the fish throws up not in the ocean, but near the land so it can walk out. And God, oh man, I'm so happy. Of all the places he could have thrown up, he threw up here. That's brilliant. You know? No, no. And he preaches the worst sermon ever. And they don't skin him alive. I was really happy to keep my skin. No, not happy about that. Right? The, the, he, the worst sermon ever creates the one of the first revivals ever. And he goes, I'm so happy. Man, look at that. Boy, so happy about that. Now, so many opportunities for Jonah to be happy, but when the rubber met the road, what was Jonah happy about? His own comfort, hoping God destroys others. Which leads me to all kinds of confronting questions about us. Have we ever found joy sitting in our own comfort, posting about people we hope God gets? Have ever done that? This is not just about Jonah and Tiglath. And Bartimaeus and Jesus. It's about me and it's about you. And what are we going to do with this kind of thing? What is Jonah doing when he's described as happy? He's sitting in his own comfort, hoping God destroys people he doesn't like. Let, let's say it this way. Next slide. God says, you care about a plant. I care about people. You're happy when your plant lives and you're angry when it dies. I'm happy when people live. And I'm angry when people die. Jonah, how you feel about this plant is how I feel about people. The whole book of Jonah ends with a parabolic object lesson that is so like God to go, I don't know if you're going to get it if I just tell you. <laughs> so here's a plant. And here's some heat. And the plant's going to give you some comfort. And then that comfort's going to go away. And, and you're going to be very upset about your plant. And that's the only way for me to get across how I feel about people. How upset you get about this plant is how I, I upset I get when people die. How, you, how happy you are when this plant lives is how happy I am when people die. Jonah, how, how you feel about your plant is how I feel 
about people. Here's the problem with plants. Here it is. The problem with plants is there's nothing wrong with them. Nothing wrong with a plant. Nothing wrong with things that give us comfort. I enjoy them. Nothing wrong with it. The problem with plants is they're hard to deal with because they're technically not wrong. But they're not permanent. That's the issue. We live in Australia. One of the top five greatest nations on earth. A nation with motor cars, paved roads, stores that prepackage food for us, clean water in our taps, machines that do washing, other machines that do drying, world-class healthcare right down the road, and it's largely free or at least affordable. No one in this room right now is afraid of going bankrupt if you get sick. Why? Because we are in Australia. Amen. Right? I'm American. We know what it's like to fear bankruptcy if we get sick enough. Right? This is Australia. When I hear Australians complain about Australia, I'm like, let me be blunt. Where are you going to go? Like, if you can't make it here, bro, seriously, 